question about how Luke and Acts thinks about first century Judaism and whether it's um, whether the text is amenable to imagining belonging across those Gentiles who become followers of Jesus, as well as those Jewish followers, which they're, you know, it's all Jewish followers of Jesus uh, until chapter eight or chapter 10, depending on how one reads things. Um, so we'll see, he, uh, so Peter does something similar in chapter two, right? So verse 22, um, you crucify. So this is uh, 223. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. So there also, I mean, like there's the you crucify, that's there. But there's also this involvement of this other force, these folks outside the law, presumably here, the Roman Empire in particular. But also it was the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So when it comes to blame, I think Luke does paint a more complex picture of that than just the you crucified. So I think for us to think about that, think that, think about that in the wider context. Um, and I think for me, the wider context, if we had more time, we could spend way more time on this because I love thinking about this is, I think Luke's depiction of the cross is, is quite distinct in a couple of ways. One, uh, both Mark and Matthew say that Jesus is a ransom payment of sorts, right? So he dies as a ransom payment so that we might be liberated from this captivity. And John, he's clearly the Lamb of God, slain for our sins. None of that language and kind of ideas are really in the Gospel of Luke. Instead, what's emphasized over and over again is Jesus' innocence. So the centurion says it. Um, and I think the other piece that's really striking then is that when Jesus dies, the reaction of those gathered is to go away mourning over what they've seen. I think there's something there to kind of, so to, to read what, what that means that you crucified is that has to be put in the context, I think of what Luke is doing with the cross in Luke 23. And there, what I think we're seeing is empire executing the innocent in the ways that we're in thrall, we're bound up in empire's violence and that we actually welcome empire's violence. So in that way, we participate in being spectators to this thing that we shouldn't have seen. So there the you crucified, I think, is um, maybe less, I think we have to be careful in our preaching, right? Because if we just leave it there, it sounds like we're advocating that it's those particular people at that particular time that crucified Jesus. I think there is this reality that that Peter's, uh, that Luke's Peter is trying to highlight, right? That these immediate folks who were there in the moment, uh, their complicity in this, but that that complicity doesn't end around the folks who actually were first hearing these uh, these texts, the, these sermons. So, yeah, it's really really tricky, um, and I wrestle with how to think about this. There's a really strong case that's made by a number of Acts scholars that says that Acts is thoroughly anti-Jewish. If you're going to make that argument, that's not a bad place to start. The kind of regular accusations that are made. And yeah, it's a little nuanced in chapter two, but what's left so often is just the you crucified. Does that get to it some, Andy, or anything you would add or yeah. think about or help me think yeah, about it, this? It, it's something I wrestle with. Helpful just to hear that we need to take a broader look. Does it because it just sounds so odd coming from Peter, who you know, he, he, he had just denied uh, yeah. Jesus uh, not so long ago. So the other piece of context then is what happens in. Oh, we're going to talk about it today. Yeah, at the um, at the end of chapter one, when Judas is replaced. So what Peter does is really striking there. So he takes on a Jesus role. He says that they need to replace Judas, and then he interprets scripture in order to do that in a way that Jesus is doing all the time in the gospel. So there's a way in which Peter kind of takes on this new mantle, not because he's great or a really good Bible interpreter or anything like that, but because of the, the work of the spirit in his own life, bringing him back into this moment. So maybe I think another way to contextualize, this is super helpful to me, Andy, to you for you to point out like that when Peter says you crucified, it's the same Peter who denied Jesus. So that that is less accusation from the top 
but more an accusation that's more inclusive, right? It's like alongside, not the top down. You know what I mean? So that's sure. you know, those pieces I think might be important for us to bring in here. Yeah. I think what you said yesterday, Eric, about, <clears throat> and this was really helpful, the speech is being Luke's excuse to do theology, right? And so to remember that he's putting these words into Peter's mouth, yeah. Yeah. right? But with a wink, right? In a, mm. in a sense, maybe. Yeah, like that people would know that he wasn't there like taking a transcript, right? But there's this, it's what Peter would have said. So maybe there's something about the Acts community and what they know about Peter, what they've heard about Peter, that this will sound like the Peter uh, that they at least have heard about, even if they've not met him. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, the other place, this is not, <laughs> not normally how Acts scholars will do this, right? But like, I think about what happens at the beginning of Romans, right? Where this isn't the same thing happening, but that that rhetoric, it's a good reminder of what Paul does there to say, like, kind of rallying the troops in that first chapter. Aren't those Gentiles just the worst? Yeah, and they do all these terrible, mm -hmm. terrible things. And then the turn at the beginning of chapter two. So is there, not that that, not that Paul and Acts are doing the same thing, but that that approach maybe is, might be helpful in our own preaching to think about how do we communicate to people the, the complicity of certain people? And then we find out all oh, the, the complicity is all of ours as well. We were witnesses of this thing that we shouldn't have seen. Mm -hmm. Mm. any other thoughts while um sorry laura can I, i'm just gonna jump in is there anything you need to say or do welcome back everybody and uh yeah just proceed awesome um yeah. any other thoughts things that came up observations that you had anything else what anything else you want to teach me uh, as we begin this is super helpful to me i think there were there are two things that have been helpful for me eric in thinking about acts and this goes back, you know, some of it to my seminary days. And um, and your point about, you know, making sure that you check for God first, right, in these stories, and that um, that it's really not the acts of the apostles, but the acts of the Holy Spirit, that it's the Holy Spirit that's running rampant throughout Acts, right, and driving everything. The Spirit gets mentioned like 43 times in the book of Acts. Yet, uh, so that's always been helpful. And the second thing that's been helpful for me too is that I really, what I love about Acts is that you've got these people making it up as they go along. They're trying to figure out what this Jesus thing means, right? And they don't have it all figured out and, and they're still making it up. And to me, that's what's so helpful about Acts is that we're still making it up as we go along in some ways. So anyway, those are two things that, that occurred to me. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think we do see a lot of that in Acts. And one of the ways I like to think about it too is that the spirit tends to go ahead of us and to surprise us where the spirit chooses to show up, that she like goes places where we didn't anticipate. And we think we're being really, we'll talk about this with the Ethiopian eunuch in particular. We think we're being courageous in going to these new spaces when it turns out they're not new spaces for God. So that, I think that's one of these kinds of imaginations that I, that I think we can provoke in folks to, um, I think it's so easy for especially folks in kind of um, on the positive side of empire, or like we're the beneficiaries of empire primarily, to kind of have that imperial imagination that when we go places, we like, we're bringing our gaze, we're bringing civilization, we're bringing order. Um, and instead of assuming that when we go somewhere that we think is new, it's not new to God, it's not absent of God's presence. So that reorientation might I think would be really revolutionary for a lot of our communities. And I think um, part of the weight of the imperial power that we benefit from is, is forgetting that, to think that we, that we bring God with us rather than God going ahead of us. So, and we'll see a couple of examples of that today in some of these texts. Thanks, Scott. Um, any other thoughts, questions, observations you had? This is all great. Awesome. Thanks, friends. Uh, uh, just a reminder of the assignment that I would love for you to like take up. You know, this, this isn't something to sit down and do a lot of work, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, if you did were to do this sermon series, what, what would you call it? And I'd love to hear some titles and some ideas tomorrow about what you might do with some of these texts. Um,
So yesterday we talked some broadly thinking about how we interpret acts. Um, and I exhorted us to treat acts not as a blueprint for putting together the perfect church, but as uh, the set of marvelous, delightful, entertaining stories that inspire in us in imagination. They're less for us to imitate and more for us to be inspired by. Inspired to imagine how God is moving ahead of us, how God is acting in a world uh, in a way that we didn't expect, that to kind of stir that imagination for us, especially in these weeks after Easter. All right, so let's jump. So yesterday we talked about um, the sharing possessions. We talked about the healing of the disabled man at the beautiful gate. And today we're going to start with the fourth Sunday of Easter. Um, this is in chapter four, verses five through 12. So this is still in the wake of that healing in chapter three. So I think it's important to, to remind folks that this is still the thing that's at play is what do we make of this formerly disabled man now made well. Um, Peter and John are brought up before the leaders of the people. Um, and look at verse two in chapter two. Uh, they're much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus, there is the resurrection of the dead. Now, I think it's important to help contextualize this, like that the dead would be resurrected is not that radical an idea in first century Judaism. It's not universally held. So the gospel writers will talk about how the Sadducees, I think the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And in fact, right, if you look at the, the whole of the Hebrew scriptures, um, the, the notions, the assumption seems to be that you live on beyond your death, really through your children, through the inheritance that you live behind, leave behind. The notion of life after death is ones that we see in a few places. So you see it in Ezekiel, for example. Uh, think about the witch of Endor, right? In, uh, in the Samuel and First King stuff, right? Like that, you can still talk to the dead, but like it's not like some like it's not like somebody's living off in some heavenly paradise and that we're tapping into the, the phone lines there. But what happens in um, in what scholars call the intertestamental period? So that time between or in those texts between the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament is all kinds of ideas are emerging. So ideas about angels, for example, start flowering um, in that context. Ideas um, about eschatology and apocalyptic thinking. So you see that in like um, Enoch and all these other texts. So that's all that stuff is out there. And then ideas about the resurrection of the dead as well. We can see an example of this in the Maccabean literature. There's this one example given of, of this widow who has seven sons. Um, and they're um, the, the, the uh, uh, Selu uh, Seleucid king at that point is trying to get them all to de-Judaize, to basically reject their faith, to reject the things that they believe. And one by one, they each refuse to do so. And each one by one, they're executed in this gruesome, descriptive way in, in Maccabees. Um, it's a good reminder, as a side note, that ancient people are really good about writing lurid, graphic, violent stuff. And then to notice how the gospel writers refrain from doing that pretty regularly. So back, so they, they go back and each one says, basically, you can kill my body, but God's going to bring me back from the dead. It's one of those instances where we see this notion of the resurrection of the dead emerging. So it's not unique to Jesus. Jesus is not, you know, the early Christians aren't inventing this stuff. It's not, they're not the first ones. But um, we might here wonder why they're annoyed, um, according to Acts, that they're proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. It could be, right? We could read this, right? In other gospels, sometimes they talk about like these uh, leaders being jealous of Jesus' power, of the, the crowds that follow him along. That may be part of it, but I think to think about these leaders in a more generous way, we might imagine the role that the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, all these other established folks have in maintaining peace. We know in the year 70, the Romans uh, with Vespasian and Titus are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. That's already happened in the past. Uh, this is so this the stuff in Acts happening before that, but Luke is writing after that event, and it's just the one of of many rebellions that have occurred, and and that Rome has crushed in uh, pretty brutal ways. So part of the role of these local leaders is to not let get not let people get 
too excited about overthrowing Roman power because they know that Roman power will just crush all these people. So maybe it's not about defending their leadership or like making sure they keep their positions or even just to fight over religion or theology as important as those things are, but a much more fundamental defense of the people and their interests. So is there something in the proclamation of the, the apostles about the resurrection of the dead that poses such a threat to empire that the local leaders are worried that if this gets out too much, the Romans are just going to crush not just the leadership, but all these ordinary people as well. So that, I think one thing is for us to keep thinking about, what, why would they be so bothered by this proclamation? So the Sadducees don't, you know, it says in, in the Gospels, don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So, but why get so caught up in this religious argument, one that leads to so much conflict? So I think there are bigger reasons for all this. All right, so that's the context uh, of all this. And it turns out they try to re re restrain it, but uh, verse four, many of those who heard the word believed and they numbered about 5,000. We get these big numbers, especially in the, in the early parts of the book of Acts, big numbers of people being added. Uh, so then the lectionary takes us to uh, chapter uh, verse five through 12 in chapter four. And again, it's pretty speechy. It's a lot of discourse, it's a lot of dialogue that I think in our preaching, we want to put in the larger context of the narrative. So would somebody be willing to read verses five through 12 in chapter four, please? Okay. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Thanks, God. The gospel mm. of the Lord. Amen, right? It's a good, it's punchy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's one of Peter's shortest uh, proclamations, but it really gets right to the point. Um, verse 13 says they see the boldness of Peter and John. They see that they're uneducated and they... Uh, they can't figure out how to oppose this, right? How do you stand against this, um, uh, this proclamation? So a couple things. One um, is that question, which is the question that I told you about yesterday is the question that's kind of been rocking around in my brain to think about a theme for all this. By what power or by what name? And to think about the, the stakes of that question. So in a world dominated by Roman power, what power is behind this? But not only that, it's a, pa it's a world too where there are all these invisible forces at play in the world. So Paul will talk about the powers and the principalities. We saw all these demonic forces wrecking havoc uh, in people's lives in the Gospel of Luke. So it's not just like a political question about whose power is this, but like wh what's the source of this and what does this all mean? We can think also in Luke chapter 4, the temptation account, uh, the second temptation in Luke is when Satan takes uh, Jesus and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Presumably, I can imagine Jesus seeing the forum, seeing the, the Roman Empire in all its splendor. That's primarily, right, the, the kingdoms of the world. That's what's at play at that con in that context at that time. And Satan says to Jesus, um, its powers have been given over to me. The picture that Luke seems to be drawing there is of 
a Roman empire that's out there causing havoc in the world, but it's really Satan at the, at the reins, so to speak. The behind this political force, there is a spiritual demonic force behind it. So this question, what power or what name, implicates not just the empire, but this, uh, this world of invisible forces uh, that we have to wonder whose power, whose name are we controlled by? Now, this stuff, I think, is hard for Americans and Westerners often to think about, right? It's the same reason that all the exorcisms in the Gospels are just really hard to preach. Maybe they're just hard for me to preach because, like, what do you, this isn't something that a lot of folks in ELCA churches and mainline churches and Baptist churches, like, exorcisms are, right, they're things that happen in movies or things that happen in certain kinds of churches where big, flashy, weird, or things that are, seem weird to us happen. So can we invite people, however, to think about those seemingly invisible forces in our lives that seem to wreak havoc wherever they go, these forces that seem to have no source that we can spot, uh, that can't really be controlled by anybody, but everywhere they go, they wreck death and havoc. And I wonder if in some ways, uh, the ways that, um, that racism and sexism and all those other isms work in our context aren't the same thing as these demonic forces that the gospel writers are talking about, but they might be akin to them, these invisible destructive forces that are with us still. By what power or by what name did you do this? And it might be good for us to call folks to think about the, the shape of the power, the shape of the name that shapes our daily walk of faith. And for us to examine by what power and what name are we moving through the world? And what might it mean for us to be moving through the world in the power and the name of, of Jesus? So we'll come back to this here. So um, Peter says, if, if we are questioned today because of a good deed that before done, to someone who was sick and there now asks this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you that this is a person healed by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, something that Peter makes clear uh, in the original healing that we talked about yesterday. This Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. And here I wonder too, this might go back to the question that I think Andy was asking. Um, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that the crucifixion in the end isn't as vital, isn't as transformative, isn't as much a historical hinge as what God has done, whom God raised from the dead. That maybe the laying of blame, the assigning of blame is utterly secondary to God's activity in redeeming Christ from this imperial death. Not only that, so this Jesus, verse 11, is a stone that was rejected by you, so you rejected it, but it has become the cornerstone. And oftentimes with these passive uh, verbs, it has become the agent of the activity isn't clear, but here it's clear that it's God, right? God has made Jesus the cornerstone. And then the, the, the finale, there is no salvation. There is salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. And here, I think we have really good opportunity to think broadly about what we mean by salvation, what it means to be saved. So I grew up in a church where salvation basically meant what happens to you the moment your brain turns off, your heart stops beating, your lungs stop breathing. And I've been, I've been struck by how often that notion of salvation has found its way in all kinds of churches, even if that's not the primary thing that we are preaching, right? That it still finds its way in. So that's an important part of salvation, right? Eternal life is an important part of it. But if you think about, again, back to Luke chapter four and Jesus' first sermon, Jesus says, today, so he reads from Isaiah, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And not tomorrow, not next week, not when you die, but today. And that Jesus is saving people all throughout his life, right? He's saving those he heals. He's saving those he exercises. He's saving those he feeds. 
right? The salvation isn't just a post-cross moment or post-resurrection moment. It's, it happens wherever Jesus walks. I wonder if in some ways, like Jesus saves Mary, Jesus saves Elizabeth and Zechariah and John, that these folks respond to Jesus even before Jesus has emerged from the womb, even before Jesus can say a word. So to think broadly about the shape of salvation and when we think salvation might happen, not in the future, but today, and how can we help folks imagine the power of salvation, not as a future promise, but as a present reality, something that we can touch and feel and taste. And this notion, there's no, there's salvation and no one else. Um, I think here, I've been getting a lot of questions from communities because part of what I do when I'm teaching Acts is to think about, and we'll talk about this here in a second again, um, the unexpected ways that God shows up in places we didn't think God would be. Some people have asked. So if, if, if Acts is narrating how God shows up in places where we assume God isn't, turns out God is already there, then how do we think about folks uh, of different faiths, for example? And I think the same uh, assumption can go there. What if we approach folks or neighbors who see faith differently than we do and assume that in some way, in some transformative way, God has been living and active in their lives and the lives of their communities. How might that change our approach, our generosity, our love of these folks if we assume that God is already present there? That this, their salvation, no one else, is not a closing off of possibilities of salvation, but an opening up. It's not about narrowing the scope of salvation, but bringing it more broadly. Um, so there's a couple of places that we can start there in this, in this text. It's striking to me that the, I don't know why the lectionary does this, but to have these two sermons that are both responses to the same healing event, and that in some ways are overlapping a lot, um, I think is striking. But I think one thing that we could do in our preaching is spend that first Sunday in chapter three, thinking more about the shape of healing, for example, and the way that healing um, and the proclamation of the gospel link up together. And here to think about that question by what power and what name. So not just the effect of, of, of the healing, but what the implications of that healing are for how we think about the shape of salvation. Uh, so that's the fourth Sunday in Easter. I'm going to jump to the fifth Sunday of Easter unless somebody has any thoughts or questions there. All right, chapter eight, starting in verse 26. I mean, it's one of the best stories in all the Bible. It's the Ethiopian eunuch story. I mean, this is just like, it's a narrative. It's rich. There's all these details. We could, you could, I feel like I could preach 30 different sermons out of this text. Um, so it's a longer text, so hopefully you'll get a chance to read it, or it's, I'm sure it's a story you've heard before. A couple of things I would point out to, to help us think about what's happening in this text. First is to notice the extraordinary request the angel makes of Philip. Um, to go to a wilderness road is a bad idea in light of what we've learned in the Gospel of Luke. Think about the Good Samaritan story. This is not a good idea, right? Wilderness roads are places where you get beat up and left for dead. Moreover, notice that this is Philip. And we first learn about Philip back in chapter six, when the deacons are, um, are chosen, to take care of the, the Hellenist widows in the community. Their job is relatively narrow. Their job is to wait on tables. Their job is important and central to the functioning of this community. But as so often happens, the church gives us a job and the spirit says, I need you to do that and some other things as well, right? The, the, the expansive call that Philip is about to get here is really striking. So we encounter this Ethiopian eunuch in verse 27, um, a whole litany of, of, of titles and of uh, characteristics. The Ethiopian eunuch, court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of our entire treasury, they had come to Jerusalem to worship and were returning home. Seated in their chariot, they were reading the prophet Isaiah. So you can point out all the layers of, of privilege and of power invested in this one person. 
um, uh, the, the amount of power and respect, the education and wealth embedded in the fact that the Ethiopian eunuch can read, can be driven, can go on this long journey, all that is embedded there uh, in a really striking way. Verse 29, the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. And I love this little detail here. Um, literally, it says something like, go over to this char chariot and glue yourself to it, which I think then precipitates a really funny scene, right? Where you have this, imagine this gilded, decorated, wealthy chariot with this powerful person in there. And the thing's clopping along at a pretty good clip. And all of a sudden, Philip has to run next to this chariot and ask a ridiculous question, right? Do you understand what you are reading? Chances are that Philip may not be able to read, but here you have this, I always joke this, uh, sweaty, breathless stranger in the middle of nowhere asking this wealthy, powerful, educated person if they understand what they're reading. And the Ethiopian eunuch says something extraordinary. How can I unless someone guides me? Which is not something that wealthy, educated, elite people are used to doing in the middle of nowhere. I think it's important also to highlight the uniqueness of, of this figure, of this character in the narrative. Uh, the kind of ambiguity that this uh, identity would have placed in this person's life. Uh, and where we can see this really sharply is in that they're willing to take this long journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. But and eunuchs can only get so close, right? The boundaries in the temple are such that eunuchs can only get so close to God. And yet Isaiah, Isaiah himself, when Isaiah and the prophets are imagining the, the, the wideness of humanity worshiping together on the mountain of God, <clears throat> at the very fringes of that belonging are the eunuchs. They're like as, as wide as you can imagine God's embrace being that, that is like the outer edges are these eunuchs. So here you have a person whose identity is mixed up, right? All this power, all this wealth, but also then uh, the limitations of belonging that they encounter. Um, he, uh, so the Ethiopian eunuch, they're reading from Isaiah, and the text is really striking. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shear, so he does not open his mouth in humiliation. And his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who, who can describe his generation, for his life has been taken away from the earth? And the eunuch asks Philip, who is this about? Who is Isaiah talking about here? And then here Luke just is trying to troll me, I think, because verse 35, Peter began to speak and starts proclaiming the gospel, but Luke does not tell us what Philip says, right? He's writing speeches for Stephen and for Philip and for Paul, for Peter and for Paul, and not here for Philip. And it just drives me nuts because I want to know what he said. I want to know what Philip said to the eunuch. Because the obvious answer about who this is about is the Sunday school answer. It's about Jesus, right? Sheep was led to the slaughter, lame sound before it's sheer. Great. I mean, that's, that's all Jesus stuff, right? But maybe not just about Jesus. Maybe it's about the eunuch too. Sheep led to the slaughter, lamb silent before it's sheer. In humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? Another way we can describe this is who's going to be around to tell his story, right? In the imagination where the people who tell your story are the children that you have. His life is taken away from the earth. When you die, so goes your story. What if Philip tells the eunuch, the story is about you? Isaiah is talking about you. Precisely because Isaiah is talking about Jesus. And then the last little bit, I love this, is they're going along the road, they come to some water, the eunuch said, look, here's water, what is to prevent me from being baptized? It's a whole list of reasons why the eunuch shouldn't be baptized. The eunuch is rich and wealthy, powerful, and Luke sometimes is not quite sure about the rich and the powerful. Um, there's a lot of scholarly debate about this, but I think the Ethiopian eunuch is a Gentile, 
And that hasn't happened yet. No Gentile has been baptized up to this point. Not only that, I joke around about this, is that you're not with one of the stars of the book of Acts. You're not with Paul or with Peter. You're with Philip, some bit player in this story. But look at what happens, right? They commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. That God answers the question in the wilderness, because there's enough water for two grown people to be in and for there to be a baptism. The eunuch asks, what does prevent me from being baptized? And God gives the answer. Nothing, nothing will prevent you from being baptized. Not being a eunuch, not being an Ethiopian, not being a foreigner. None of these things prevent you from being baptized. Uh, professor? Yes, Scott? Could you give a just quick scholarly mm, comment on verse 37, please? I was just about to do that because that's my favorite part. Oh! Of segue away. <laughs> so, I love, so if you can have people have their Bibles open, and they can notice, ask them, right? I often do this when I'm teaching this text. Ask them in what verse does the eunuch ask, what is to prevent me from being baptized? And then give them the, the, the trick question of the day, what number comes after that, right? So 36, 37 is not there. In our text, there's a little footnote. We'll come back to it. And then 38. So we look at the footnote in, in my Bible. And this, most study Bibles will have this, right? Other ancient authorities add all or most of verse 37. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So I think this is another interesting part of this story, this narrative, is that someone along the way decided that there was at least one thing that prevented the eunuch from being baptized. And that's that they didn't confess. They didn't use their mouth to, to proclaim Jesus and to embrace Jesus. So I grew up Southern Baptist, right? So we'd say, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch didn't go down the aisle and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So I think this is an interesting thing. Part of the story to tell here is that in the story, nothing prevents the eunuch from being baptized. And yet somebody in the church, a scribe, somebody copying these texts decided, no, no, no there, there is one thing that prevents you from being baptized. And what I like to remind folks is that even if the signs in the front of our church says, you know, everyone is welcome. Uh, it might as well have an asterisk next to it that we mean, well, everyone is welcome if you look like us and think like us, if you don't try to change us too much. The spirit goes where the spirit chooses to go. So one of the things I love about this story is if the Ethiopian eunuch is a Gentile, we'll notice that this story never comes up again. Nobody talks about the eunuch. Nobody notices, partly because the eunuch goes home. Right? And part of what may be happening here, and this is uh, Clarice Martin's insight. Remember in Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Ethiopia, in the, imag the cartographical imagination of, of first century folks, is the ends of the earth. Well, at least, right, not Ethiopians don't think they're the ends of the earth, but the Mediterranean region kind of imagines Ethiopia as the ends of the earth. So what if the gospel reaches the ends of the earth and no one notices what if a Gentile is baptized, but no one notices because it's just Philip doing it right in the wilderness? What if this is one example of God's spirit moving ahead of us in extraordinary ways um, of God doing these new things that sometimes we're just not privy to? We don't see, we haven't witnessed. I think that's part of what's happening in this narrative. These um, things happening in the background, things happening off the stage, so to speak. So another way to think about it too, in Acts 28, when Paul gets to Rome and he's imprisoned there, a bunch of Jesus followers come and see him and Paul hasn't been in Rome, but apparently something is happening in the background, something that we isn't narrated, something that we haven't seen, where the gospel is spreading and there's already a community of Jesus followers when Luke, when Paul makes his way to Rome for the first time. I love the story uh, and there's just so much you can do with it. Um, can make people uncomfortable by talking about Unix. People love this stuff. So, um, And I think the other piece is that, right, the, 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 this and the next text we'll talk about are examples of, uh, of how the certainty that folks in, in the church can have about who belongs 
is a certainty that, that God loves puncturing, that God loves looking at the boundaries we've drawn around our communities and just tearing them down and opening up uh, the shape of grace in our lives. Yeah, I love this story. It's one of my favorites. All right, so connected to it is, and this is the last one we'll talk about today, I think, uh, is the sixth Sunday of Easter, <clears throat> Texas to Acts chapter 10, electionary Texas to 44 to 48, which, surprise, surprise, is the thing that Peter preaches. See the pattern there? What's missing is this big, long story. So Acts chapter 10 is long. It's complicated. It's this layered story, and things are repeated over and over again. It's a story that Luke's going to tell um, a couple more times in the narrative as well, right? So this is a story that keeps coming up that's going to precipitate the concerns that follow all the way to Acts chapter 15 and the great apostolic council and the, de and the decision that Gentiles can be a part of this community, part of this belonging um, in, in their own way. Um, so the starts, right, the Peter and Cornelius narrative, sometimes uh, study Bibles and others will talk about the conversion of Cornelius and his household, I think that gets it exactly backwards. In reading this narrative, notice how Cornelius doesn't really change. I think it's Peter and the church with them who's changed. It's the conversion of Peter's imagination that's in view here. So, sort of beginning of chapter 10, Cornelius, centurion, should expect him to be a bad guy, but it turns out that he's a devout person. Um, uh, his prayers have ascended into God's ears is something the angel tells Cornelius. So Cornelius has one vision, one instruction, and he follows it right away. He sends his men, his, his, uh, his, his slaves, his enslaved people, and this devout soldier to go get Peter. It's very cinematic. About noon the next day, Peter has his own vision. He's hungry. He goes up to the rooftop. But his vision is a little bit different. It's a little bit more confounding. Three times, this blanket comes down from heaven with all kinds of animals. And three times, the voice says, get up, Peter, Peter kill and eat. And three, time Peter's, three times, Peter says, I can't do that. Happens three times. He wakes up. He's really confused by this. He doesn't know what to do with it. Cornelius' men show up. Peter, you can tell, is a little bit hesitant, but goes with them. Uh, look down at verse 24. The next day, he goes with them. Some of, his, some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. So there's a crowd of people who come with him. They get to Caesarea. Cornelius is expecting him. And this detail is important. He called together his relatives and his friends. The whole neighborhood is over Cornelius' house. And things go terribly wrong. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshipped him. Like Cornelius just, just pagans all over the place. Like just does the thing that Peter probably most fears is that Cornelius is just going to be such a pagan, right? He's a centurion. He's a Roman. He, he tries to worship him, but Peter makes him get up, says, I'm just a mortal like you. Um, and then they share the story about what happened to them, to each other. And they're trying to make sense of it, trying to figure out what, what this all means. And then we get to our text, actually close to it. We're getting there. Um, Oh, no, it has 44, not 34. Okay. Actually, we're going to, it doesn't give us Peter's sermon. Sorry. It gives us the, the, the aftermath of Peter's sermon. Okay. But this is good stuff. So Peter um, is uncomfortable here, I think, because he's preaching. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but when I get uncomfortable, I just start preaching. But he gets it. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. Right? This insight, he gets it, but then he just keeps on going and he's preaching and he's preaching and he's preaching. And then we get to our text. It's a long, so prelude to it. So I think part of the challenge of preaching this will be to figure out how do you tell that whole story leading up to this moment? Because I think it's important to get us what happens in verse 44. So somebody will be willing to read uh, 10, 44 to 48. Sure. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
Then they invited him to stay for several days. I love how this starts, that while Peter was still speaking, it's just really funny, right? So like Peter's just jammering on, just keeps on talking and he would have kept on preaching, but the spirit shows up. It says the spirit says enough of this, Peter. I've been trying to show you the whole time what's happening here. And I'm going to show you in this tangible way that you can't deny that you can't just preach your way through in order to make sense of this. The Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. Remember who the all is. Cornelius, okay, we get, right? Cornelius' prayers ascended to God. Cornelius, sure, like try to worship Peter, but, you know, God forgives us all, right? God sees where we fall short. But Cornelius also had his whole household there. His children, presumably, his spouse, his enslaved people, but also all his friends. And I don't know about any of these people, right? We don't know their their credentials as, as people to receive the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit falls where the Holy Spirit chooses to fall. Before they can ask, before they can pray, before they can say magical words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. And I think in a, I think Lutherans and Reformed folks avoid this a bit more, but I think there's still this sense that like we like choose the spirit for ourselves. And I think there is an element in that, like where we have agency in this, like the God gives us space to have that agency, but we so easily miss that the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit will do. The reaction of those who came with Peter is disappointing. They're astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. And here I just was like, just shake them and be like, have you not been reading the narrative the whole time, right? Like, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Like, who did you think you'd find at the ends of the earth except a bunch of dirty Gentiles? Like, weren't you listening when, um, uh, in the first couple of chapters, when it's like a Broadway musical, right, of the Gospel of Luke, that Simeon says that Jesus is going to be a light to the Gentiles? Or when the prophets say that all the nations of the world are going to gather together and worship on the mountain of God, or when um, Abraham is called to be a blessing to the nations, to all of them, or when God creates all the world and calls it all good, like, weren't you paying attention? Didn't you know? How, did, how were you surprised by this? But my disappointment, my frustration with these folks has to give way to the reality that I do this all the time. That when God, the spirit falls upon people who I don't think are deserving or have asked or done the right things to receive the spirit, when they receive the benefits and the generosity of God's grace, it make, can make me really uncomfortable too. How might we form communities that are not astounded when God does the thing that God always does, which is to surprise us all the time, what if we form communities that are expecting God's surprise all the time? That we know that we don't have it all figured out, that we don't know the boundaries of God's activity. We just know that God is doing this, this new thing all the time. Peter asks, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people, which to me sounds a lot like the Ethiopian eunuch's story, right? The eunuch asks, can, um, um, how do they put it? Uh, what is prevent me from being baptized? Basically here, what is prevent them from being baptized? And so Peter orders them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Another thing to help point out to people here is um, in, in Acts, there's not like a regular way that um, confession, repentance, baptism, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit, they're not like a menu of options, right? Where you go from one to two to three to four, but they happen in all sorts of interesting ways. In this case, the Spirit comes first and then baptism, and who knows anything about confessions and repentance? Um so there's all these different patterns throughout in Pentecost. It's hearing the good news. It's repentance. It's bapt It's the spirit baptism. And it's sometimes for some people, the spirit shows up early. Later on, we'll find out that there are some people who've been baptized 
in, in, in John's baptism, but they haven't received the spirit. And so when they get baptized in the name of Jesus, then they receive the spirit. You know, that, I think it's just a reminder that God is always moving in, in ways that we don't anticipate, that we don't expect, that God doesn't have these rules set by us that we get to predetermine how God will move. So the big question for me again is by what power and what name? And I wonder if sometimes in the case of these last two stories, the, the power that we've imagined is a God who is constrained by our imaginations, by our sense of who belongs, by our sense of who we are and who they are, um, by our assumption that, that we know how God will act in the future because we've seen how God will act in the past, but what we've missed is that the primary characteristic of God's activity and acts in the past is that God is in the business of surprise. And how might we help form communities that approach that surprise not with hopelessness or deep anxiety or resentment or grievance, but with this hopeful, joyful, delighted expectation of the new things that God might do. Uh, so I think we've got a couple minutes left. That leaves us two texts for tomorrow. So this will work really nicely. So we can talk about uh, Ascension slash Seventh Sunday of Easter, kind of make choices what to do in that Seventh Sunday. Um, it's basically the first chapter, so you can basically pick any part of that chapter to, to hang out with um, in your sermon if you choose. And then the day of Pentecost, of course, on, on uh, the Pentecost text on the day of Pentecost. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, and again, if you can just keep these stories in the back of your head and see if you come up with a series title or a series description that you might share tomorrow, that'd be um, fun. I, I, at least I think that'll be fun. Maybe you don't, but I think that'll be fun. Um, Eric, questions? Uh, yeah, maybe this yes. is something for tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> can, can you uh, reflect tomorrow maybe on the challenges that the revised common lectionary gives us by chopping these texts up and putting them in a fruit basket order. And it, it drives me nuts. And I, I loved preaching the narrative lectionary when I could, but now I'm in the RCL and it drives me absolutely bonkers sometimes. Yeah, so, and I think for me, the big thing is the way that it severs the larger narrative context and it's all out of order, right? Like we jump to like, like it's just not in the order that I would put this in. So um, I think there's plenty to criticize there, but I think there's also deep gifts in, in, the, in the lectionary too. I think, uh, the, so let me tell you, I did not know that there were lectionaries until I went to seminary. Like I grew up in a church where the pastor would do like, basically like, I'm going to do a series on Romans and three months later, we're like in chapter one, verse four, right? Like, it's just like, the, like, I'm just going to do whatever, like the spirits tell me to do it, right? But really it's whatever I'm interested in, <laughs> a little combination of that. So part of the gift of the lectionary is that it's this text that you just got to figure out what to do with. Um, and that we know that many other people are wrestling with that same text. So wherever we are, Minnesota, New Jersey, somewhere around the world, these are the texts that are our kin and the faith are wrestling with together. I think there's, there's a deep gift in there. So what, the challenge for us and what I want to call you to um, is to not let those, the constraints of the selection constrain the storytelling that you'll do in your preaching, right? So that you're inviting people into this longer, broader narrative um, that's happening in the book of Acts. And part, you know, the series might help in that because you can say, kind of give folks a sense of the arc of where your preaching is heading, but also give them a glimpse into the kind of story that you see Acts is telling for your community today. So I think that's a real gift there. So yeah, there's plenty to criticize. But man, what a gift too. Like what a, what a challenge. And I, I remember there were times, especially in, in recent political history, let's say, where like the lectionary text would just line up just really on the nose and you're like, what, what is going on here? Uh, Herod texts and other things. Anyway, so like, right, so there's, there's gifts there as well. Anything you would add, Scott? Anything else that, is found, that you found helpful or anything no, else just, that you all have done? It's just, uh, you're right. It's both gift and task, right? It's, it, um, 
that when you're, especially when you're preaching a series and even not, you know, when, when things just jump back and forth, it, it gives us as preachers, you know, whiplash. And so I can only imagine what it does to our people, but, but you're right. You know, the telling the overarching narrative is really important. Um, but on the other hand, we're also a bit constrained, uh, you know, um, our Lutheran congregations don't allow us to go on for 40 minutes, right? Um, <laughs> let alone 10 or 12. So, yeah. so there's a balance there. Yeah. Well, that's a gift to your voice because otherwise, you know, after 40 minutes, you can't talk as much. <laughs> and also, <laughs> who wants to listen? I know I made you listen to me for 40 minutes, but who wants to do that? Uh, so yeah, so, and I think the other piece, I tell my students this a lot too, and you all know this, right? Like there isn't one sermon that's going to give people all this like biblical knowledge and understanding of Acts, for example, no one series is going to do this. So this is one, this could be like one set of efforts, like a couple of six weeks here where you're, you're laying some, some seed down, you're kind of like creating some possibilities for interpretation. And then you tie this together over years of ministry, right? Like this is, um, and plus people have read Acts before they've heard some of these texts. They, they're not coming in like totally blank, um, but you can do is help them give some hand, maybe some new handholds for how to think about what the narrative is doing and how that narrative might shape their lives, right? So if we can, I think for me, if we can help uh, help people lean away from like Acts is the perfect church that we can't be towards a broken and beautiful church kind of like us, then I think that's that's really good work. Other thoughts on on lectionaries and it's, gifts and limitations or other thoughts or questions. I think we have maybe time for a comment more. All right, friends. Thanks for coming back. It's good to see you all again. Thanks for all the great insight, um, all the your thoughtful participation. I really appreciate this. So tomorrow we'll do Ascension, the first chapter of Acts, basically, and then Pentecost. And, um, and then we're, I want to hear from you about um, what the sermon series might be called. If you don't do it, that's fine. You can just come up and just say you don't want to do it, and I will not think any less of you. But if you think of it, that I just, I just love to see the, how people put this stuff together. All right. Thank you, friends. Thank you. We will see you tomorrow. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Xavier. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Eric. Yep. See you tomorrow. All Bye. Right.